A symbol is anything that is agreed upon to designate something else. The advantage of symbols is that they may communicate complex concepts while being simple in and of themselves. Most symbols are simple drawings that consist of a few pen strokes, while other symbols are objects or actions. The diamond on a wedding ring, for instance, is a symbol. Imagine all the things that can be inferred about a husband who gives his wife a wedding ring mounted with a piece of glass or a random pebble instead of a diamond. An apple is just a fruit and yet has been commonly associated with education, wisdom, and teachers. A wink is an action, but also a symbol. It is often used to communicate sexual interest or to convey a hint. The symbol, whether it's a drawing, action, or object, often conveys a message far more complex than the symbol itself. The foundation of all symbols is agreement. When a symbol is repeatedly used in the same context, agreement regarding that symbol's meaning is formed. As time progresses, the symbol's meaning solidifies. If symbols are used randomly, with constantly changing meanings and associations, they fail to be symbols at all. After all, what good is a symbol that means something different each and every time you see it? Illuminati symbolism, used in popular culture such as movies, novels, and TV shows, isn't used randomly either. Believing that all-seeing eyes, pyramids, and suns are inserted into random places in a movie is an easy mistake to make. But let's think about that. Let me take you to a backward universe where the meaning of symbols is arbitrary and random. A world where hospital signs lead to fire stations and elementary schools. A world where the play and pause symbols have no bearing on what the buttons actually do. A world where radiation signs, biohazard symbols, don't walk signs, and dollar signs are placed randomly throughout the city and used interchangeably. You get the idea. If used randomly and without repeating context, the symbol fails to be a symbol at all. We don't use symbols randomly. We can't afford to and neither can the Illuminati. The Illuminati is more dependent on symbols than most, and the reason is that it allows for secure communication no matter where the messages are located. As long as the masses are kept outside of that symbol's agreed upon meaning, any message can be hidden in plain sight. And, as stated earlier, not all symbols are drawings. This is so important to remember as we move forward. The Illuminati share a tradition similar to how Christians, Muslims, and Hindus share a tradition. Compared to the overall population, Christians, for example, share similar beliefs on the origin and history of man, the major cosmic players like Jesus, God, and Satan, and what is moral and immoral. The Hindus share a story with hundreds of gods and general consensus regarding their respective histories, duties, personalities, and relationships. If Hindus insisted on telling stories from their traditions, and embedding that tradition into their works of fiction, a repeating story would slowly emerge. Almost all of the religions and mythologies contain at least one sun god. The Illuminati only retell one kind of story, the story of the quote-unquote gods. Angels and demons to some, aliens to others, and the gods to the rest. Because of this, the ones writing these stories in modern times are in some ways limited. Because their story is actually based on another story, the gods, they can only add in so much variation. If the retelling adds in too much variation, it will no longer resemble the original story. So how do they manage thousands of accurate and semi-accurate retellings all while you're unaware? Symbols. Symbols are the key. And this is exactly why they, like us, can't afford to abuse them. Without their extensive collection of symbols, they would be unable to retell the same story in novels, movies, TV shows, and even music, and conceal this fact for centuries. The Illuminati are often accused of sun worship, but this is absurd. They have no interest in the ball of fire that traverses our sky. Their only interest is in the God 
or character that the sun symbol represents. So if you think that this eye or that pyramid is in a random place, think again. Never forget, it's only a symbol, and they can't afford to abuse it. What's the bottom line? While you're watching Saved by the Bell, they see the story of the nations, because they know the symbols. While you're watching The Lion King, they again see the story of the nations, because they know the symbols. With their countless symbols, insiders inform other insiders which character is which relative to the Illuminati's tradition. The Illuminati share detailed information on demons, spirits, angels, and aliens, beings who we, throughout the ages, have called the gods. But most importantly, they share detailed information regarding individual archangels and demons. This tradition also includes their respective histories with each other, personalities, agendas, abilities, lineages, and loyalties. To them, characters like Satan or Archangel Michael or Gabriel, for instance, are not distant and abstract like they are to Christians, who are given very limited knowledge regarding these individuals. To the Illuminati, these characters are as tangible as politicians or celebrities are to us. Each of these gods has their own history, personalities, etc. But by lining up multiple retellings of these very same characters, and discovering the parts where they all agree, outsiders like us are capable of reconstructing bits and pieces of the Illuminati's inner teachings. And since the beginning of this documentary series, that's exactly what I've attempted to do. This documentary is, for all intents and purposes, the sequel to Hollywood Insider's Full Disclosure and could have easily been called Full Disclosure 2. Of course, only quote-unquote Hollywood insiders, forgive the expression, are writing these kinds of retellings. So naturally, you'll find repeating themes in stories written by a particular insider, but also a repeating theme occurring in the stories of several writers. Each writer, being bound to a single root story, the gods, can only change the point of view, context, and timeline. Further, it's okay if a different author writes a script for a sequel of a movie. Using the context and characters the first writer decided on, the new writer is likely to write the sequel similar to how the first writer would have. The sequel will be nothing more than the next segment in the timeline, using the same characters, context, and settings the first movie used. Sometimes in movies, things are said, or jokes are told, that seem to make no sense. It may have been a scene or joke intended to be understood only by the illuminated. Some jokes just aren't funny, and some scenes just don't make sense unless you're familiar with the symbols and the root story. If a certain writer in Hollywood writes an insider's retelling, it's altogether likely that much, if not all, of their other stories are retellings too. In this documentary, I'll be reviewing many of the movies that were discussed in full disclosure, but instead, following the career of those Hollywood storytellers. Once again, it all starts with this movie, The Man Who Would Be King. The Man Who Would Be King was released in 1975 and stars Sean Connery and Michael Caine. It's a film about two Englishmen who hatch a plan to travel to a primitive nation and steal its wealth by claiming to be divine beings. They arrive and are initially met with hostility, but are mistaken for gods by the particular natives they encountered first. They become the immediate leaders of this tribe, and would lead the tribe to victory after victory as Danny sets out to conquer all the surrounding tribes. But before his military victories are complete, Danny, played by Sean Connery, is discovered wearing a charm adorned with the Masonic compass and all-seeing eye, and the remaining people, still unconvinced of his divinity, become believers. Apparently, there was a prophecy among the natives regarding the arrival of a man with such a mark. All the nations unite under his leadership, and he comes to rule the entire land for a brief time. Slowly, Danny starts to forget about his original intentions to get the golden run, and decides to stay and take a wife and remain as leader, while Peachy, played by Michael Caine, decides to take his half of the gold and some soldiers and go home. But before Peachy can leave, Danny is bitten at his wedding and revealed to be only human after he's seen bleeding. During their escape, their gold is wasted, and after a small fight, they are captured and punished. The short story that the movie is based on 
was written by a member of the Illuminati named Rudyard Kipling more than a century ago. And since the movie's release in 1975, this movie's storyline and concepts have been reused by other Illuminati insiders in Hollywood. A detailed comparison of The Man Who Would Be King and these other movies can be found in Hollywood Insiders, full disclosure. In this film, I'll simply summarize those comparisons. From the outside, which is the same as not being familiar with the symbols, it appears that the following movies are blatant rip-offs of The Man Who Would Be King and each other. But maybe that's not what's happening. Maybe what's happening is that The Man Who Would Be King, many of the following movies, and countless, countless others, are all based on the same root story, and because of it, simply appear to rip off of each other. Roland directed, and in many cases produced and wrote the stories from movies like Independence Day, Stargate, Godzilla, The Day After Tomorrow, 10,000 BC, 2012, and a few other crappy movies. His retelling of the man who would be king, or the most obvious one, was Stargate. Stargate is about a portal that's been lying in the sands of the Egyptian desert for ages. The portal was discovered by an excavation team and decades later was activated. The portal, once activated, opened a gate to a planet on the other side of the universe. The group chosen to walk through the Stargate consisted of a small special forces squad and an Egyptologist named Danny. Similar to Danny from the man who would be king, Danny from Stargate is given a charm with an all-seeing eye on it just before departure. After walking through the Stargate, they arrive to a primitive land whose locals take notice of Danny's amulet and mistake him for a divine being. After a series of events where most of the soldiers are killed, the local people all unite under the leadership of Danny and the remaining soldiers. Eventually, the sun god Ra, the antagonist of the movie, is killed by Danny and Jack. Afterwards, Daniel decides to stay and take a local for a wife, rather than going home to the Stargate with Jack and the remaining soldiers. There are even some scenes in the movie that appear to deliberately draw from the man who would be king. The Day After Tomorrow, released in 2004, was everything we've come to expect from Roland Emmerich. Stale characters, bad dialogue, factual inaccuracy, and needlessly long. The Day After Tomorrow is about a series of disasters that have been triggered by global warming. The first indication that this was a bad movie, aside from Dennis Quaid, is NASA's answer to Roland Emmerich's request that they do scientific consultation for his new film. What's NASA have to say? NASA said for your people to stop calling their people. Apparently, Roland asked NASA to, you know, give him a few pointers regarding making his movie more scientifically accurate. Evidently, not even an army of rocket scientists could bridge the gap between Emmerich's newest film and scientific reality. NASA, who has always pushed the global warming story, declined to have their four little letters associated with the movie in any way. Why, you ask? The film contains scenes and scenarios that would make even Al Gore blush giant hurricane ice storms that can freeze anything in seconds, tornadoes in LA, blizzards in India, all caused by global warming, somehow. <laughs>